All right, hi guys. I'm Taylor, you all know that. Um, so my topic is about the human-animal bond um, and anthropomorphism, which people may or may not know about. Um, it's a, a lot lighter topic than the topic of AIs and stuff and all that doom and gloom. It's got a lot of fluffy puppies in it, but it's also kind of existential, as Professor Maple said. So the two main questions that come from both of these are like in, the, in that order are why do we love animals so much, um, specifically like our companion animals, and why do we want them to be like us? Um, some of you may think that you do, um, or you don't. So, let's see. All right. So, um, before I start, how many of you own pets, or you have a family pet? All right, that's a lot of people. So, uh, according to the 2017-2018 uh, National Pet Owners Survey, 68% uh, of U.S. households own a pet. That's 85 million families. In 1988, only 56% of families owned a pet. Uh, I'm going to be as brief, brief as not brief, brief as possible um, because this is a large topic with a lot of data and a lot of facts and stuff. Um, so, if there are questions, which there probably be, the end is totally a good place to ask them because I'm going to just breeze through stuff. Um, you know, get to the point, but also quickly. So my first point is about the human-animal bond and why we love animals so much. Uh, the main things I want to talk about are biophilia, uh, what we love about animals, and why we love animals more than others, some animals more than others specifically, like our dogs and cats. So biophilia is a term coined by Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson. It describes how the human species has an innate affiliation with the natural world. Now some people believe this, some people don't. It means that we're automatically attracted to things in nature, things that are living. So it's more than that too, it also deals with the psychology of people. So Hal Herzog um, outlined this as the importance of being cute. In his book, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, which I spent my entire summer reading for my independent study. So a lot of this is drawn from stuff I, I learned over the summer. We are attracted um, more to animals who are visually appealing to us. Uh, this is why the general um, population uh, likes warm, furry animals over like cold, slimy, reptile type animals. I mean, that's not the case. I like lizards too, but... <laughs> uh, we are attracted more to animals that resemble ourselves, um, which is going to touch on that a little bit more later. Uh, a key factor in um, how most people feel about animals is that animal's appearance. Go ahead. Alright, so, the importance of being cute, right? So, the uh, good example is the giant Chinese salamander versus the panda. Uh, I didn't put a real picture of a panda, I'll get on that in a second. Uh, the most important factor in attraction to animals is how they look. Psychology. Uh, the way people feel about animals is also linked to their appearance. So, this guy, right? Kind of gross, looks like a giant slime ball, right? So, this animal is actually far more endangered than that panda, yet the panda is used for all sorts of environmental and endangerment brochures and everything. It is the logo of the World Wildlife Fund. Because people like pandas, people don't like slimy salamanders. <laughs> I mean, I think this guy's pretty cute. So I'm going to change my life to see this um, So one, Hal Herzog also said, uh, one of the largest factors in how much, pe how much money people say they will donate to help an endangered species is the size of the animal's eyes. Tiny oh. salamander eyes. So, um, and the panda doesn't have big eyes either, right? But it has the giant circles that make it look like it has huge eyes. So, another very important reason um, in our increasing attachment to animals that Hal Herzog touches on is the changing demographic in America. Um, uh, American demographics have changed, is what he said, this is a quote, uh, and more people are living alone. People are getting married later, if they get married at all, and they're having fewer kids. People are more attached to their pets because they're filling a hole, right? So people living alone, you don't want to come to an empty house every day, get a dog, a cat, you know, some animal, right? <laughs> so, but Herzog does not believe that most people care more about animals than humans. Uh, he says that we want to help animals mostly because they can't help themselves. They're an innocent being. We love them because they're, you know, they're pure, right? <laughs> if most of us feel this way, then why aren't all of us vegetarians? 
It's easier to devote more care and attention to this individual animal um, a small, or a small number of animals, your pets perhaps, uh, than a large number of animals. So when bad things happen consistently to animals in mass, we tend to uh, distance ourselves from that. So the factory farm treatment of animals, all that abuse and stuff. Um, it's completely understandable. There's a general principle in psych psychology that Herzog points out called the, the collapse of compassion. It's the principle that the bigger the tragedy, the less people care, because it gets harder and harder to care about so many people. Um, mostly, all of this love and attention extends to our own animals and the animals we associate with on a daily basis. Um, numerous studies have shown, uh, and also animals make us feel good, my last point about this. Um, numerous studies have shown that significant, there are significant biological advantages uh, and effects of owning a pet. So you come home, you see your pet, you pet it, it releases endorphins and hormones in you that make you feel good, like oxytocin and all that stuff. Uh, they also provide us with unconditional love, which everyone innately loves is unconditional love. So, how does our love for animals affect the animals themselves? I'm going to limit this to dogs because it is a very wide topic um, about all sorts of breeds of animals and species of animals. But dogs are the easiest to see, like, the, tr the before and after of when we started to love dogs so much. They are the clearest example of how our bond with that animal changed the animal itself over time. So in the past two months, only the past two months, I've been asked five separate times by different people how we went from this Look. to this. <laughs> Big difference, right? People are like, how do we get from a wolf to this tiny little like dog? So the simplest answer is because we wanted pets. We wanted companions. The dog has moved up. It went from a wild animal to a working animal where we would just use them for hunting, for herding, for all that stuff, all your working class dogs that you see on the like dog championships and stuff. So the working class dogs, and then we went to frou-frou companion animal dogs. So our strive to breed these cuter pets um, have completely changed what dogs look like. Uh, this is why we have so many different breeds of dogs. Uh, we want them to look a certain way. We want, they've been popularized in certain countries, like England has the English Bulldog, and then they bred the French Bulldog, and then it's called the French Bulldog, not because it originated in France, but because it became popular in France. And they love the French Bulldog, which is smaller. Um, in our strive to breed these cuter pets, um, it boils down to our appearance, and it's that also important psychology again. So why do we love the pets that look like that? I mean, I think the wolf is very pretty, but you know, that's scary compared to the little pet, right? <laughs> so Conrad Lorenz is a huge pioneer in the study of animal behavior. You may know him from the imprinting stuff if you've ever taken a psychology course. They discuss him, there's, there's ducks and imprinting and all that stuff. Um, so he said, Humans are innately drawn to anything that looks like a baby. Infants, puppies, ducklings, young animals that share features with human infants, large foreheads and craniums, big eyes, bulging cheeks, and soft contours. Uh, he termed this as the cute response. This is um, that an animal that looks more infantile. Uh, the more infantile that animal looks, the cuter we think it is. So the more it looks like a baby, the cuter we think it is. Uh, he called these infantile creatures features with big foreheads, huge eyes, small bodies, are called baby releasers. So they release that, um, our innate and maternal or paternal instincts. Uh, that, oh, it's a baby, I must like, love it because it's, you know, it's so small. Um, Health Herzog, author and professor of psychology at Western Carolina University, he also, he focuses mostly on human-animal relationships. He describes how our desire for this cute response has affected our dog breeds. Most of this is in a negative manner. Uh, this is, why is it a bad thing? So let me introduce you to the brachiocephalic bunch, which are our smushed face dogs, right? So these are all called brachiocephalic dogs. They have, it's actually like a mutation that's dangerous because they're, they don't have, they have short faces, right? Big heads, smushed noses, and, you know, they look like puppies for the rest of their lives. So Herzog termed this as <laughs> wanting perpetual puppies. Uh, so these dogs, excluding the boxer, all of these dogs get no bigger than 
about that much in their entire lives, so they look like puppies forever. Uh, their heads also remain disproportionate to their bodies, and their faces remain round because they have no nose. Uh, it comes with a lot of health problems, which is, is the, the negative effect of this. Uh, these brachiocephalic dogs are more prone to respiratory issues, obviously, and obesity because they do not do well with a lot of exercise or stress or hot conditions. You're technically not supposed to own a French Bulldog or a Bulldog or a Pug if you live in a really like hot climate, so Florida. But tons of people own Pugs and French Bulldogs and Bulldogs here. So why do we prefer dogs and animals in general that remind us of human infants? <coughs> Anthropomorphism. Uh, anthropomorphism is the attributing of human characteristics to something non-human, mostly animals. Uh, the United States is the leading promoter of anthropomorphism in the modern world. This is especially seen in Disney movies. I'll touch on that again in a second. Uh, so why is America the anthropomorphic capital of the world? According to the American Pet Products Association, Americans spend a total of $23.04 billion on pet food, $14 billion on supplies, $15 billion on vet care, and $2.7 billion on live animal purchases, and $5.2 billion on pet services, like boarding and grooming. We're spending massive amounts of money to ensure our pets receive quality care and services, kind of like ourselves. And in some cases, people spend more on their animals than they spend on themselves. So you have your puppy salons and your puppy daycare and all that good stuff, puppy clothes, all that stuff. So one company that continually capitalizes on this, Disney. <laughs> we all love Disney, right? <laughs> Disney World's not far. So when first making Bambi, Walt Disney brought in real life bonds for his animators to study. He wanted a realistic looking fawn. Um, so he brought in, the, here, click it again. Um, he wanted a realistic looking fawn, but we turned out with Bambi, right? It looks, it looks similar, but also very different, right? The proportions are definitely off with Bambi. And that's because um, more realistic isn't necessarily the cutest for audiences, especially children. So before the movie was finished, he had the animators make Bambi look more like a human baby rather than a deer baby. So another Disney example is Steamboat Willie. You may not all, you all know who he is, but you may not know that name. Um, click it again, there you go. It's Mickey Mouse, right? So starting off to look more like his animal counterpart, Mickey Mouse, you know, as you see, he looks more like a mouse there. And in this one, it's kind of hard to notice in these pictures. I tried to find the one that like showed the same angle, but it was really hard. Uh, so when Steamboat Willie was around way back in the day, um, he was, wasn't as popular as Mickey Mouse is now. So they were kind of wondering how they could make him more appealing. So they increased his head size, decreased the body size, and gave him huge eyes and human looking gloves, and made his face more round. So he looks more like a child than a mouse. Uh, Disney still continues to capitalize on America's tendency for anthropomorphic behavior. Case in point, Click it and click again. Everyone knows this movie, right? This is anthropomorphism. This entire movie is anthropomorphism. So it's animals that look and act and do things like people. The entire movie. They've got houses and all that stuff. Um, so mostly for your enjoyment, I'm going to include some really common examples of anthropomorphism. But a more common one that not many people recognize as anthropomorphism is this. So I'm going to give you guys a quick little quiz, don't worry. Um, click it again. So how, how many of you believe that animals can feel guilty? You've seen the videos, right? The dog looks like, you know, he's shamed and all that stuff. Dog shaming pictures, right? Actually, no. Dogs can't feel guilt. They feel ashamed, but they don't feel guilty. They cannot feel guilt. Uh, according to Susan Hazel, uh, any appearance of guilt, she's a, she's a leading veterinary psychologist, and um, for dogs and stuff. Uh, she, she said any appearance of guilt or uh, contrition in dogs um, is the result of the animals having adapted to live with humans over thousands of years. Basically, they learn to act in a submissive way when their masters express anger or glabber down towards them. So dogs will show appeasement-like behavior uh, that some owners interpret as guilt. Uh, it's because the dogs have learned 
uh, to pick up our emotions before we even like express those emotions. So they're geniuses at that. Um, Alexandria Horowitz actually did a, a study with treats about it, and I read this in my independent study too. She would put the dog in the room with two milk bones, uh, or one milk bone too, depending on the size of the dog, and then the owner would go in there. The owner would look at the dog and say, don't eat the treats, and then she would let the owner walk out. And then when the owner came back and the treats were gone, they'd get angry at the dog and the dog would look guilty. But in some of the cases, Alexandria Horowitz had taken the treats herself. The dog didn't actually eat the treats. In some cases they did, but in other cases she took the treats and it was like the same feeling as if they'd not eaten the treats or if they'd eaten the treats. So they don't really, they don't feel guilty. So, all right, so in closing, I'm going to wrap it up real quick. Some really cute examples of anthropomorphism. Um, it shows like everything, right? So dog shaming is the big one. You think they look guilty, right? You know, this one ate a shoe, that one ate a six inch sub, and then that one let it, a mouse eat its food and did nothing, apparently. They're really funny. I love dog shaming pictures. See, anthropomorphism, we love it. And another example, animal clothes. Right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> See? There you go. The reaction, right? You think yeah, dogs that look like people are really cute. They look like tiny people, yeah. Look more so, Definitely in New York. again, I got another one. One that I found kind of disturbing but also really funny is that people have weddings for their animals. Why? Like, what, what, is, the, what is the point, right? You know? They don't care. <laughs> they look cute, but they don't really care, right? The cat's really cute. So now you guys know some reasons behind our love for animals. It isn't exactly just because we love them, right? They, they are tricking us into loving them more and we're making them more lovable every day. Uh, you know how de dedicated people are to their animals here in America. And these are all the cute examples of anthropomorphic behavior. So like next time you catch yourself thinking, oh, my dog looks like he's really sad today, or the cat looks like he's up to something, right? Anthropomorphism, right? Because they really don't feel the same things that we do. And it makes, us, it makes us feel better about ourselves that these dogs kind of, you know, imitate us and look like us and all that stuff. So you got to see some really cute pictures of dogs. <laughs> so thank you.